This is the Property Development Book Club podcast. Please be advised that the views expressed are of the individuals and do not represent their employers and should not be taken as advice. Please do your own research and seek advice from an appointed professional. Hello everyone, I'm Adewale, founder at A Lake, and today I am interviewing the sponsor of the first six episodes of the Property Development Book Club Season 2. So, Hannah, if you can please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Hannah Afolabi. I am founder and managing director of Mood and Space. And like you said, I'm sponsoring six episodes of the Season 2 of Property Development Book Club. Yeah, so it's quite interesting that we're interviewing you because Hannah, as well as myself, we sorted this group out and it's so interesting that you are now sponsoring yeah, I know and you're, full you're, circle yeah so um <laughs> it's great to have you here Thank um you. but we wanted to dive in because I'm, I'm very conscious that you recently established your business coming from being a development director yeah. at Balfour BT which yeah. is one of the largest developers in the country and you've gone to set up mood and space so before we get into that I just want to congratulate you Thank on you. that transition Thank you very so much before we get into all the questions how was that transition for, for, for you or yeah. How has it been? For how you? has it been? So, um, like you, so like you said, Balfour BT um, is one of the largest um, construction infrastructure companies in the UK and in the world. And in yeah, I mean, they have they also work out in in America, so they've they've got a, a large chunk of the market share, um, and uh, it got to a point after working on one really great project on the Olympic Park, East Wickham Sweet Water, where. I remember speaking to you about this. Yeah. It was like a moment of like almost like intense clarity that this is n- like you can't stay here and where you're going, like if you even if you look at other opportunities, nothing's going to satisfy. Mm-hmm. What I felt like I needed to do was to leave. Um, and so Mood and Space, I had actually set up the website in 2017, wow. I think. <laughs> yeah. So I had always known, like, as- aspirationally, I would want to go off and do my own thing. The thing I didn't know was what, right? And we'd been speaking a year before about, you know, what, what does that even look like? Yeah. Um, but it was a moment of like, okay, I'm going to just do it. And it's like, jump off a cliff or stay here and die. <laughs> <laughs> so dramatic I know but it was more like you know like if you stay here what are you going to achieve mm-hmm. but if you go what can you achieve yeah and one of the things that keep, people keep telling me is oh how brave I am you know you're so brave for leaving and for me it felt um it felt like I will be and I always think about this as like my 60 year old self it felt like a betrayal of my 60 60 year old self to stay in this role yeah like if I didn't leave I'll regret it Yes. Is that is that point, right? Yeah. Is that I'm going to look back on my life and say, I didn't achieve something that I knew I wanted to do. And is it braver to to step out and do your own thing? Or is it fear that drives you to stay in security? We're going to get into that. Because okay. that fear <laughs> element you mentioned is a, a very powerful thing that keeps mm. people from blossoming and uh, expressing and themselves exactly. in a way that and makes thriving. them thriving and thriving, thriving. Yeah. we're gonna we're gonna come into okay. that but we're gonna we're, we're obviously going fast forward and we're coming we're gonna okay. rewind okay. way back okay. into the history <laughs> of Hannah Folabi, the managing director <laughs> of Mood and Space so I wanted to just talk us briefly very very briefly through your journey so we're talking about um your experience of maybe living in a large-scale housing your experience of that, what your decisions were when you went to study, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. if you just give us a brief summary, yeah. if that's okay, please. So I study, so I grew up in Haggerston. So Haggerston Estate in Hackney. Mm-hmm. And Haggerston is uh, now <laughs> a very different area. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, where we lived was earmarked by um, Hackney mm-hmm. for regeneration. Yeah. So for 10 years, and I guess it was then since, since 2000. So since 1997, um, they had left it to kind of go derelict. Mm-hmm. So we had we had um, squatters. They didn't have the security doors on our block because they didn't want to invest in it because they thought they were going to be doing regeneration. So when mm-hmm. other blocks got the upgrade to that and they got the lift upgrade, we still had the stairs open plan. And so there were times where people would be doing drugs on the sca- stairs and you're mm-hmm. too scared to even go down because yeah. you're like having to pass. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and or they'll just use it for all asbo behavior and stuff like that um so that was kind of my reality growing up and I remember Hackney Council doing regeneration, like their public consultation yeah. pop-ups. And I would just like walk past it and like I hear some of the other ladies in the, in the, um, in the neighbourhood like shouting at the guy saying, you know, you've been saying this for years, nothing's going to happen. Or our neighbour having a chat with my mum mm-hmm. and dad about it. But my parents um, benefited from the right to buy and so we had bought our property. So when they did announce the Olympics, they finally said, okay, yeah, you could... Uh, we'll buy you out, we're actually doing development now, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so people were like, no, it's not going to happen. And then, like, sure enough, blocking up windows and doors and everything. And so it happened. Anyway, so we moved out to Rumford, fast forward college, et cetera, et cetera. I then went to um, University of Sheffield where I studied architecture, architecture. as an undergrad. Interesting. Yeah, it wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> so the university was great. The the subject was great. What I realized was, like, I think what, what, I, what I felt was an identity crisis. As mm-hmm. one of four black students within the school at the time, it was very, like, shocking to me grew, growing up on Hackney. Yeah, in Hag- very diverse. Very diverse. Yeah. I went to Leighton Sixth Form, and then all of a sudden, it's just, like, a sea of white people talking about things that I can't relate, relate to. Mm-hmm. Um, and... It just didn't feel like I was like out of place immediately. Uh, Anyway, I got through university. I was working at um, uh, as an architecture assistant in Nigeria, and that's when I decided I didn't want to study architecture anymore. Mm -hmm. I realized then that actually I prefer to be on site, project managing, seeing concrete being poured, um, doing meeting minutes, like appointing the MEP consultants, etc. So when I came back, I started working at Peabody Housing Association. Yeah. Um, and then I was working on um, the Elephant and Castle Regeneration Borough Triangle, mm-hmm. where Macarthur Metropolitan Tano are today. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started doing um, meanwhile use intervention for like Peabody. So I did it for Fish Island and oh, Fish um, Island's in Hackney, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, in Hackney. I think the developer was um, remind me Hill. It was Hill Partnerships Hill did Fish Partnership, Island, but yeah. someone else was in there. So it was Peabody and Hill for the for the for the fit for Fish Island, but there's also West. There was Western Homes, and there's just been a number. There's Gall- Galliard are there. Um, yeah, there's a number of contractors around yeah. Fish Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then was working on this regeneration project, and this was a really really fun one. But this is when I realised actually I want to do large scale regeneration. Mm-hmm. Like the delivery was cool. I worked on Embassy uh, Embassy Gardens with Ballymore. 98. Is, that, is, is that in um nine elms nine elms yeah so was so, you was your development manager there i was uh my title was development officer okay so i was doing the section 106 98 um uh, high-end shared ownership units yeah in um in nine elms uh ballymore yeah working like opposite ballymore managing the delivery mm-hmm. and i was doing a couple of other section 106 is and land swaps and remedial work projects etc yeah but the thing that i loved the most was the regen yeah. like the large scale regeneration um and i was like actually this is this is what i want to do i want to focus on this yeah uh, so after it was pulled from planning for various reasons i went and worked at link city or Buig. And that's where you were able to make your transition from development manager to development director. No, that was at Valfour Beatty. That was my <laughs> next job. But it was there that I, I worked on Hosel Quarter, which is just around the corner from here. Yeah. And that was where I learned a lot around like what the d- DM in is, if that makes sense. DM in is development management. De- development management. Yeah. So it's like like really like understanding the intricacies of every stage of the process. And mm-hmm. then I took that to Balfour Beauty and that's when I was working on Eastwick and Sweetwater under the JV with places for people. Yeah. And that's when I scaled up and I scaled up. People always say, how did you, how did you transition so quickly? I was like, I worked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> like I worked really hard, like especially to get the planning applications through. We had 15, over 15, nearly 1600 homes submitted through the, to planning from Reba stage two all the way to stage three, middle of stage three, we submitted it in, uh, so we started in earnest, beginning of February, we, sim- we then submitted it by December. Mm-hmm. So we had 10 months of like intense design, yeah. 1600 homes, five architects, a large development 
uh, team and I was doing 16 hour days like every single day committed yeah. to this so that's how I scaled up basically so we're, we're now gonna just go through that because you've you've explained like a like I would call it an encyclopedia of the experiences that you've had yeah over working in public sector private sector and large scale development now Obviously, all of that experience has now transcended into mood and space. So can you just tell us what was your ambition? Because we obviously we touched on it in the beginning. Yeah. Now, all your experiences led up to this new, amazing venture. Yeah. Tell us about what you believe mood and space is going to solve. So, okay. So mood and space is focused on, so it's a development consultancy. It's a development company. At, at its core, it's development consultancy. And the the thing that I've learned, as in my skill set, and the skill set I can like I can teach others and bring them along to help with on projects, is the core of what Mood and Space will be. Yeah. But the thing that I've always been frustrated about with how we deliver is how top-down it is. Yeah. Uh, especially with large-scale regeneration projects. And on, on the podcast, we were just uh, previously discussing yeah. how, you know, on regen, it can be quite insensitive to people. Having lived it, mm -hmm. having seen it through projects I've managed, I want to see if we can do it differently, if we can do it better. So what would you say is different that you'll be doing? I think fundamentally it's a bottom-up approach to development. And it's not necessarily co-design because people think you have to go all the way to co-design mm -hmm. to, to understand how people are yeah. affected. It's about sympathetic development. Yeah. It's about un like being considerate of every single journey yeah. that is going to be impacted by your development. Yeah. And I'm not talking just your occupants, I'm talking about the weaving of existing people mm -hmm. or this existing of the types of people. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you have a primary or secondary school near, nearby, they are going to remain, consider how they will walk through your development. Yeah. And like, you know, those are occupants of an area that is already pre-existing that you need to like, um, to thread through. And, and I really like the fact that you're you're going to be adding in your lived experiences yeah. and you're going to use your working experiences and you're going to mesh that into this amazing new venture. Mm. Now, question I have is, yeah. I'm looking at your, you've got an architectural background. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Albeit you lived in it for a very short period of time. Yeah, I had to go. Um, <laughs> I wanted to get an idea of um, what is your appreciation for architecture generally in, in when you look at the projects that you want to manage? So I love architecture. I actually love buildings and I love the inside, the outside, the experience, the impact it has. All of that, I really do like the built environment. And I think in terms of an appreciation for design, I think it's so fundamental to the experience of how people live. Mm -hmm. And so, but for me, design is just not the aesthetics. Yeah. And, I, and I always try and push this very strongly. <laughs> it's not just the the facade, facade and, and the yeah. elevation and how it staggers it's actually how it's used and operated and one of the first things I learned was that architects are supposed to be problem solvers mm -hmm. and so for me like especially through design we're supposed to be solving the problem of either a lack of like isolation or um, convenience mm -hmm. or um, security and that should be done inside the four walls and not outside and so I don't like I struggle with this idea for giving awards to architects and architecture that is aesthetically pleasing mm -hmm. but doesn't function how it's supposed to function. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah Fallaby. I am the managing director and founder of Mood and Space. Mood and Space is a development consultancy that focuses on social value and community focused developments within the built environment in urban contexts. Uh, we've been going for not too long, just under a year, and we've worked on some amazing projects in and around London. If you're interested in finding out more about what we do, please do get in touch. Mood and Space are sponsoring season two of the Property Development Book Club podcast. If you want to hear more about what we do, please like, share and subscribe. I'm Adam Wale, director at A Lake, and you are watching season two of the Property Development Book Club podcast, sponsored by Mood and Space. So, we've talked about the amazing things you're going to do in your business. Yeah. We've talked about your ethos around having a ground up approach. Yeah. Now, the question I have now is more looking at you as an individual. Okay. Because we're talking about a black woman, mm -hmm. yeah, that operates in an environment and in a business that doesn't always have a lot of black women. Yeah. So, 
you are the founder <laughs> of Black Women in Real Estate. Yeah. What made you start it and what was your experience as a black woman being in the in the property development world? Yeah, I think in while I was working at Peabody and, and I guess in the third sector, I would say, mm. there are definitely more ethnic minorities yeah. that work there. Not that many within the development teams, mm -hmm. but definitely in the housing, in the housing and the broader organisation. Yeah, correct. So in terms of my experience of, of feeling out of place, I didn't necessarily feel that while working within Peabody. I was very conscious of the fact that most of my consultants were typically white. Yeah. Um, um, but when I moved to private side, on my floor at Link City, I was the only black person, one of two black people on a large scale floor of, yeah. of professionals. Um, and I think that was like a very like, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, moment. Also, like it started making me more conscious about changing my hair, my hair, about like, you know, bringing certain foods to work and stuff like that. And like how I had to overcome this idea of like trying to make myself small to fit in. And I actually like decided to reject that as an ideology. Yeah. And then I moved to Balfour Beatty and I was on construction site. So it's like, that literally, <laughs> I am literally out here in the sea of people, right? Yeah. And at that point in my career, I said, there are just not like I haven't seen and I haven't seen any black women development managers full stop. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen any black women who were more senior than me mm -hmm. full stop yeah. within the private sector. Yeah. In the public sector, in housing yes, associations, yeah, I have the chief execs. Yeah. In, 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 in many public sector In the private sector, I just didn't. Exist. I just didn't yeah. know. So I didn't even know where the other black development managers were. So I went out on LinkedIn and I. Um, I, I literally did a stalk and I started looking at JLL, Savills, all the organizations and I'll find a black person and I'll message them mm -hmm. and then I'll invite them to dinner. And so there was 15 women that I invited to dinner and that's where Black Women in Real Estate started. Amazing. And the, the issue that I identified is firstly retention, second isolation, because now we work with so, like also we have so many members, mm -hmm. so many variety of members, but typically it's one or two people from one organization. Yeah. And so we've got Crown Estate, we've got Grosvenor Estate, we've got Landsec. These women are amazing, doing great things in high places, mm -hmm. but they're so not present on the scale of the representation within the industry. Yeah. Um, and so now what we're tackling is firstly the retention, but also representation very very interesting and, and and I think that 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 whole point around this burning desire for you to start a business this burning desire for you to maybe organize black women mm -hmm. in the real estate sector I think that is very testament to your you must have a lot of ambition <laughs> so we're now going to go into this whole point around ambition what is your ambition for the business what type of clients are you looking for and who should be calling your phone to use your services? Yeah. Okay. So my ambition for the business is like, and it's going to sound a bit crazy, is to change the way we do development. That is my ambition. If we can stop doing, like if we can create a framework mm -hmm. or a process which actually drives for more sympathetic, sensitive, considerate development that is people focused, community focused, I feel like I've done a, a good job, even if it's not everyone, but there's now a, a course of people who say this, this is how it should be done, not just cookie cutter and stick in like a copy and paste, but mm -hmm. actually a framework of how to engage people to deliver better. Mm -hmm. That would be like that. I think I've, I've met a part of my goal. Yeah. There are two other things that um, I wanted to point on, like under mood in space. One of the things that we're working on is a social value research piece for future places. Mm -hmm. And I like the, the aim of that is to understand what people really drive, think as is social value. Yeah. So for me, understanding what that is mixed with my core skill and at least my lived experience, having that as a framework and then embedding that in the process, taking it out to industry and saying, look, this is how you can do it better. It's also something that yeah. uh, I really want to do. And that as an ambition is great. The third thing is really like lifting the veil around what development is. We as an industry are so like so masked off, like the language we use is <laughs> just over the top, even with architecture, with developers, it's not engaging. And what happens and why people can't can't engage properly is because they don't understand what we're, what we're doing. Like <laughs> we make it seem so much yeah. grander and bigger than what it is. And I think that is like 
something that we need to work on to remove this, to remove a barrier of, and distrust. Like the way where regeneration is now is developers are literally like spending millions of pounds just to get through what should be an almost simple process. Mm -hmm. Because firstly, the communities are like are literally um, protesting against yeah. the, 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 the development. Um, the local authorities don't trust the developer. The, the local people don't trust the local authority. Yeah. And so we're in a very like really like difficult place of like large scale regeneration having to satisfy so much and so little at the same time yeah, that it's so. not actually benefiting anyone. And so when you ask who should call me, it's people who are struggling to get their regeneration projects through. Yeah. That is where, that's my bread and butter. So who would that be? House and associations? House and associations, developers. But I really want to work with people who have like a similar ethos, like who really want to see development done well okay. as well. And so, um, or who want to see placemaking done well. So it's not just, it's not just regener or residential regeneration. It's just like, it's the idea of like placemaking, or want of a better word, but like um, community-based um, interventions yeah. done well. That's who, who I would love to work with. So across the in the sector spectrum, but a variety of people who who really need to unlock their projects. Yeah, that that is very interesting, and I think that with your experiences, we're talking about the things you've done your ethos and the fact that you want you've got such an ambitious task to <laughs> redefine development <laughs> that is quite phenomenal and I, and I and i wish you all the success on that um i've got another question around black women in real estate okay and you know this is i've got my two daughters running around <laughs> as you know and this is more like a question for like your future children my daughters etc like what world would you what world would you want them to exist in in this real estate space. In the real space. estate space. Yeah. Do you know what? Um, real estate is so difficult, like as an industry, it's so difficult. And it's difficult uh, for a few reasons. Um, one of them being that no one, everyone's following other people and no one knows what the answer is, right? Mm -hmm. My hope for future black women is that they don't have to struggle to get in the door mm -hmm. and they don't have to struggle with a glass ceiling because of their gender and race that's yeah. my hope and the way i see that actually happening is why people and people in leadership not seeing diversity as a deterioration of their power yeah but also by black women taking up space yeah and so one of the things i always say to the ladies and i always tell anyone is that I learned very quickly, and it was that journey of just being the only black person in, on the floor, the only black person in a, a meeting room, or in meetings where there's 60 year old plus white men, and I'm having to tell them like what to do, that my blackness, my characteristics, my perspective is my superpower. Yes. And so for every young black woman, I would say, that is your superpower, stand yeah. out. Do you know what I mean? Take up that space. Mm -hmm. You deserve to be there. Yes. And so if we can, as black women, encourage and create that confidence, as well as educating and pushing for, at least in my generation, I'm hoping that the generation below me don't have to go through that, push for you know our senior leadership within the industry to understand that power is not being dissolved, mm -hmm. but actually you're gaining expertise and you're solving a resourcing crisis and you're continuing on your legacy. So if we can do those two things, then I think like the world, hopefully for our kids, will be smooth sailing, fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> There'll and be other issues, but not that. So I think that that kindly brings us to a conclusion. <laughs> Um, where we've spoken about the amazing founder of um, Mood in Space, her amazing outlook on development and the industry. And you know what? I, I didn't get a chance to ask you what you think the opportunities and the threats are within <laughs> this 20... Because we had the budget that came out. Yeah, the budget, yeah. And actually, we're better off doing that because this is going to be out there forever. Yeah. So what is what do you think in your personal opinion what are the opportunities that you see within this climate that we're in so we're talking about recession yeah we're talking about um the government making it easier for certain types of individuals yeah to crack on and 
but we also know there's threats as well. So I yeah. wanted to just get your view on, in terms from your business perspective, development, what are the opportunities and threats from your perspective? Yeah, there's a very unique opportunity in time now where local authorities now have their development powers back. They can make real change. They can yeah. make real influence. They can reshuffle the graph that showed them dipping in the delivery of the really delivery, housing. Correct, yeah. And like that could be a massive up, uptick in changing the narrative in delivering for these people in delivering for the people in chasm people who are at like the the lowest of let's say lowest of our society but people who are struggling the most in our society yeah and i would love to see that happen and i'd love to just see them do it well yes sorry that was like a big no no, no it was, big it, it, answer. It was, i think we talked about social structures which is very important because yeah. today's budget does touch on elements that helps some people in terms of the energy crisis yeah but, but not enough. the majority of it is at the top of wealth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And not um, people who, who actually genuinely yeah, needed help exactly. through this mini budget. Yes, exactly. And, 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 and then the other thing you mentioned around the government house building. Yeah. So the graph shows how private is all the way up there and then local, local government authorities, is, yeah. If that can be rebalanced, we will hit our housing targets in a nutshell. So I think that basically <laughs> brings us to a conclusion. We have spoken to the founder of Mood in Space, Thank who is you. sponsoring this episode and then six episodes in, in total. And we would like to thank you, one, for your sponsorship <laughs> and two, for um, gracing us with your opinions on the topics. And we hope that all the young women, as well as males, you can obviously watch and listen to this interview and be inspired by some of the things that yeah. Hannah's doing. Thank you. So thank you all. Is there anything else you'd like to say before no, we close? If if you're watching, please get in touch if you want to have a conversation or challenge my opinions. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn and on uh, Instagram. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I've been your host today. I'm Adewale. This is the Property Development Book Club. Like, share and subscribe. This is the Property Development Book Club podcast. Please be advised that the views expressed are of the individuals and do not represent their employers and should not be taken as advice. Please do your own research and seek advice from an appointed professional.